So I have made this video for a couple of reasons. The first one is because a student got in touch with me through the website at uklawweekly.com and asked a question about this area of EU law and it got me thinking that while I do cover this area of enforcement of EU law in passing through a number of the videos, it's not something that I really deal with specifically itself. So I thought it would be a good opportunity to make a video and the second main reason is that I wanted to give you all an opportunity to admire my wonderful corona hair before I possibly get it chopped. So enforcement of EU law is going to be the topic today and we're going to try and work out and see how the principle has developed over time and how enforcement actually occurs. So hopefully it will set you up to do some good work on problems and essay questions. So with that in mind, let's get started. The starting point for us here is a very simple principle of EU law called effectiveness. And this tells us that EU law should literally be effective. In other words, if I have a right under EU law, then I should have some way of enforcing that right. Now, that is all very well and good, but the problem is that the EU themselves don't specify any particular procedure or method of enforcement. Instead, we can look to Article 19 of the Treaty on the European Union, which tells us that member states shall provide remedies to ensure effective legal protection. In other words, it's up to the national governments to provide some way of enforcing EU rights, and that's obviously going to come down to the courts in most instances. This gives us the core principle of national procedural autonomy, which tells us that the national legal system get to decide on how rights under EU law are to be protected. And the central case for this is Ravers and Thrall Finance from 1976. Furthermore, there's no requirement for a court in a member state to come up with new remedies. And we originally saw this in the case of Raver Handels Gesellschaft Nord in 1981, but it's still a principle that is important today and has come up in cases like the Unibet case in 2007. Furthermore, we can even think of an example off the top of our heads where there is a prescribed remedy if we think about the Frankovic case, which is mentioned in another video. Anyway, while that central principle of national procedural autonomy is to some extent still with us, over the years it has been worn away by a number of other principles that have entered into this area, and that's what we're going to spend the rest of this video focusing on. The first of these principles is the principle of equivalence, and the idea of equivalence is that remedies and procedures that you would normally have available in national law, say in the UK or Ireland or France, should also be available in respect of EU law. So, say for example, in a particular area of the law, in the UK I would be able to get an injunction against another person. Well, if I was enforcing a right under EU law in that same area, then I should also be able to get an injunction. I guess that makes a lot of sense. Meanwhile, there is another principle of practical possibility, which is the idea that national rules and procedures should not make the enforcement of EU law practically impossible. In other words, there has to be some way for me to be able to enforce my rights under EU law. We can look at the case of Barra and Belgium from that form from 1988. Again, it's something that makes a lot of sense. However, we see these um, ideas and the erosion of national autonomy going a little bit further as the years progress. So we also have the idea of proportionality. Now, this is, again, sounds fairly sensible on the surface. It's that sanctions imposed by a national court should not be disproportionate to the offence. Now, the EU law um, does allow for some leeway in this area. So even if something would normally be a civil penalty, it's still possible that a member state would be allowed to impose a criminal sanction for that. But generally speaking, the awards of compensation or the fines that might be imposed on a person or a company should be proportional to the offence that was committed. Furthermore, there is this principle of adequacy, and I've included a quote from the von Colson case here. That quote says that compensation must be adequate in relation to the damage sustained. And it's worth going over a little bit of von Colson here. It's a case that maybe some of you are already a little bit familiar with, but basically the idea here is that von Colson was discriminated against on the grounds of her sex um, during a job 
application process. And the award of compensation for her was basically just the travel that she had used to go to the interview. She didn't really get any full compensation for actually being discriminated against. And the Court of Justice basically said in this instance that this was unfair and she should be able to get adequate compensation, which is fair enough. We see from cases like Halen's from 1987, which was to do with a Belgian football trainer who was trying to get work in France, that he should have been able to do that. And again, we can see how the principle of adequacy has also moved into other areas like the free movement of persons as well. The other final principle is one that we've already mentioned, and in fact we talked about it right at the start. It's this principle of effectiveness, or that EU law should be effective. But over the years we have seen the principle of effectiveness kind of taken to the next level. And so there's a number of examples, especially in the early 90s here, where the Court of Justice has enforced the principle of effectiveness in a way that erodes that national autonomy that we spoke about. So I've highlighted a couple of examples here. In fact, to tame one, it was told that the UK courts had to provide interim relief um, to the claimants in that case, even though that was not something that was actually really available under UK law in that particular circumstance. Furthermore, we have the example in Marshall 2, which is again another case to do with employment law. The idea here was that the tribunal worked out the amount of compensation that should have been due. It was around £18,000, but the problem was that there was a statutory limit at the time on the amount of compensation available, and the amount of compensation should really have just been about um, £6,000. So um, how do you balance those two things out? Well, the EU came in again and basically said that the, um, the statutory limit on compensation had to be removed so that Marshall could get the full compensation in that particular case. Now, I think that the Euro European Court of Justice kind of realised that they had gone a little bit too far in some of these cases. And in the preceding years, again in the later 90s, we saw that there was kind of like a redressing of that balance and that there was a move away from such a heavy-handed approach. A good example of this is Steenhorst Nearings from 1993. This is to do with the time barred action, and it was kind of interesting because it was a similar principle, a set of facts, to the case in Emmert that I mentioned on the previous slide. Now, even though these two cases had a similar facts, in Steenhorst Nearings, the court went the other way, and instead of eroding national autonomy, they actually gave the national autonomy back and said that the um, national courts were able to impose their own rules in this particular instance. Kind of in a similar way, ex parte Eunice Sutton is kind of the converse of Marshall II, in the sense that um, national autonomy was given back to the UK in this particular instance, even though the facts of the case were relatively similar with Marshall II. So where are we with this today? Have we finally achieved the perfect balance? I think the answer to that question is kind of. The approach of the Court of Justice today is really very much dependent on the context of every specific case. So what happens in relation to compensation is going to be different to what happens in relation to injunctions or time limitations, for example. We started off with this strong principle of national autonomy, and while that hasn't exactly been killed off, it has certainly been compromised by a robust effectiveness requirement that has been developed in the case law. That's all very well and good, but I think for me this actually puts a lot of pressure on the national courts. After all, they're the ones doing this on a daily basis, and it's a requirement of them to not only apply the national rules and procedures that they have within their own member states, but it's also a requirement of them to be able to give enforcement to rights under EU law. And that can often put them in a difficult position where they sometimes have to get pretty creative in the way that they approach things. I think that if this type of question comes up as an essay question, you can talk about how this area of the law has developed over time and use some of the case law to back up your points. There's also some really good articles that you can find online as well. If this comes up in the context of a problem question, again, that context-specific approach is going to be really important. So think about the types of uh, right under EU law that is trying to be enforced 
and how the Court of Justice has approached that over the years. I hope that you found this video useful. If you have, then make sure to do the whole comment, like, subscribe thing, and I'll be back with another video at some point in the future. Thanks very much again. Bye!